Welcome to the show, everybody. We are on the I Am Real Estate Show. This is Ray. I'm with my wife, Sandra. Say hi, my love. Hey, hello to everyone. Hey, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Today, we are sharing the mic with John Spur, the owner of Inspired Life Mortgages. How you doing there, young man? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. We got a lot to talk about, so let's get right into it. I'm going to talk about there was a Fed meeting on last week, and you got a couple notes that you thought were interesting to relay to everyone. Yeah, so the Fed Reserve announced a quarter point increase. Um, and again, I don't think these rate hikes are a bad thing. It was something that was necessary to get this market in control. Right. Um, so I, I don't feel like what they've done is unnecessary or bad, or mm -hmm. I do think they may have overdone it. <laughs> um, but, like always, right? The government. You know, <laughs> it, it, is, it, it is something that absolutely needed to be done. Um, the... Fed stated that they are going to need to do further increases. Um, and this may sound scary to yeah. a lot of people. They're going to keep raising rates mm -hmm. and keep raising rates. Um, but I do believe if they don't keep raising rates, milk's going to go to $7 or $8 and, you know, everything else is going to keep going up. So there's there's a trade-off here. The nice thing is the rate that the Fed fund, that the Fed controls, is not mortgages. It doesn't affect okay. mortgage rates. Um, there's an indirect correlation that sometimes mortgage rates will go up in relation to the Fed fund rate going up. Uh -huh. um, but let's think about this. October was the peak of mortgage rates. Right. The Fed has still raised rates four times since then. But mortgage rates have come down. So right, right. these further increases most likely are not going to affect mortgage rates. They're going to affect your credit card payments, uh, auto loans, and those type of things. Okay. Um, with, th with that being said, where do you see rates today? And, and where, you know, what should people be watching for as far as where we're headed to the near future? So, um, mortgage rates, the reaction to the Fed increase, they actually went down. Mm-hmm. Awesome. We now, like to hear that. This isn't a, hey, they went down so much I can go buy a bigger house. It was a very <laughs> small, <laughs> minuscule amount that they went down. Um, but most places are quoting rates in the mid sixes. Okay. Rates, as far as I'm concerned, are not in the sixes. I can get, for well qualified borrowers, high fives. Um, and it really has to do with who I do business with and the overhead that we have. Okay. Okay. Um, what would you define as a well-qualified buyer? So, and I think we've, we've talked to this at a meeting recently. Mm -hmm. um, right. The FHFA, which is the Federal Housing Oh, uh, I can't remember what the other F is, agency. Uh, Federal Housing Finance Agency, and they run Fannie and Freddie's, right. you know, cost of funds, you know, gotcha. basically, and determine what charges need to be made for somebody that has bad credit versus a low down payment or high down payment, so on and so forth. Um, they moved that meter on us recently. So... A well-qualified borrower would have been somebody in the 720, 740 credit score range. Well, mm -hmm. now that's been bumped up to 780 um, to be on the high end of things. So if I'm looking at a well-qualified, so somebody going to say a well-qualified borrower is going to be able to take advantage of those great rates, it's mm -hmm. going to be a 780 credit score, and you're going to have 20 to 25% down. And then you're going to be in that band where we can definitely get you under a 6% rate. Okay. And if they are if they are not at the twenty percent, they're at fifteen percent or ten percent. Does the rate change that much, or the fact that they got to have that mortgage insurance makes a big difference? So, what's funny is if you put nineteen percent down instead of twenty percent down, you're going to get a better interest rate, but you're going to have mortgage insurance, just like you said. Right. So one of the things that we like to look at is with people that are putting twenty percent down. Let's do 19% down. You're going to have mortgage insurance for maybe 18 months, and then it's going to fall off. But you're going to have a rate that's an eighth to a quarter percent better. Right. So this new grid that came out, what they call loan level pricing adjustments, and it's basically assessing risk to 
your credit score, your down payment, your payment history, all these different little things that they look at to determine what your rate should be. Mm -hmm. The new grid that came out, there are some areas where you're better off putting down less money than more money, and you're going to end up with a better interest rate. So it's it's really interesting what they did with this ra last round of changes. I want you to say that again, because there are probably people thinking, oh, he doesn't know what he just said. He got that backwards. Uh, no, I... I know exactly what I just said. It, it's confusing all of us, I promise you. Um, the, the, there are sections on this new loan level pricing adjustment. And again, the, the, we call it LLPAs. And all that is, is just a fancy term for assessing the risk of a borrower. There are certain areas where if you put less money down, you're going to get a better rate than more money down. And I know that is just counterintuitive, but that is what they have done. And they have all the numbers and they all have all the data and I'm sure they have a reason behind it. I don't know what it is, but we've picked up on it and we're able to use that to your advantage when we're helping you get financed. What I'm hearing, and <clears throat> I just want to get this across to everyone, is that when you're dealing with mortgages and you're dealing with finding someone that's going to help you, you need to have someone who's willing to specialize it or tailor it to you. And we're talking to you all the time. It's, everything is individual and it's not, hey... Here's what we have. Here's our packages. Use this. No, what do you have? Here's your, here's your limitations. Here's what you can exceed at. Here's our best, our best solution. You're looking for a solution instead of providing a, a whole big, a big array of uh, ideas. No, I, I mean, mortgage lending is just like going and buying clothes or shoes. I mean, there's not a one-size-fits-all. There just isn't. I mean, unless you're going to go wear a potato sack, and you don't see people running around in potato sacks, and you sure as heck right. don't want to get a mortgage from a potato sack. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it, it's... Everybody's financial uh, position is unique, and it changes. Every four or five years, your financial position is going to be different than it was before. Um, so the mortgage we do for you today, when you sell that house five years from now and buy another one, we may do something completely different. Right. So we go through a process and ask questions to get to understand you and your needs, and then we give options, and we tailor those options to what you're trying to accomplish. And the, and the market's always changing. This new... Um, uh, system that you're talking about came out when? Gosh, two weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. So every every week, two weeks, three weeks, the scenario changes. Absolutely. The target is always moving. I, I mean, how many times have we met and talked about changes to mortgages since October? It's every a time lot. we turn around. Every time you come on the show. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. There, there's a new guideline change. There's a new LLPA. There's a new product coming out, a product going away. It's constantly changing. And so we stay on top of that so that we know we're getting our clients, our customers into the right loan to suit their unique situation. Right. So if you're viewing this online and after the show has aired, I would just encourage you to look at the date, reach out to John because things could be different by next week. I mean, it, the industry is always changing. John, how can people reach you? Uh, they can reach me on my cell phone at 520-247-3610, or they can always give me an email, john, J-O-N, at inspiredlifemortgage.com. Okay, we're headed to the break, and we're here with uh, John Spur of Inspired Life. He's the owner of Inspired Life Mortgage. I want to thank you for spending part of your afternoon with us. You are listening to the I Am Real Estate Show on KBOI 1030, The Voice. Welcome back to the show, everyone. You are listening to the I Am Real Estate Show. We're sponsored by the Johnson Smith team at Indy Realty. We have with us today John Spur of Inspired Life Mortgage. He is the owner. Hey, John. Um, what I wanted to ask a little bit about was, you know, for us as consumers, um, when we're shopping for a product, it's very easy to just find the model number, get out there and see who's got the best price. Yeah, I mean, Amazon, Google, right? Right, right. What's a, I mean, that's what we do. Honestly, we know if we're getting a good deal or not because we can just look it up. But that's really tough in the mortgage industry. Yeah, it, it's shopping online for a mortgage opens up a lot of pitfalls. Um Number one, the minute you go on to any of these sites like uh, Lending Tree or Nerd Wallet or any of those guys who allow you to compare credit cards or auto loans or mortgages or any of those things, it seems real convenient. You're going to go there, you mm -hmm. see every bank, you see all their rates, so on and so forth. As soon as you put your information in there, they sell it. And you're going to have every mortgage company on the face of the planet texting you, calling you, emailing you. And let's remember, we just went, we just 
lost 80% of the mortgage volume in one year. You got a lot of starving mortgage loan officers out there. They're going to say anything that they can think of saying to try to get you on the hook to do a loan with them. And chances are the person reaching out to you may not even be a lender. Absolutely. Uh, it's a, it may just be a call center asking you questions that they're allowed to ask so that doesn't require them to be licensed to get enough information from you then to push you onto a mortgage loan officer um, who probably doesn't have a lot of experience if they're working at a call center, which is uh, going to be another issue, especially in today's market. You want uh, a loan officer that has years and years of experience to help you get into that home and maximize your purchasing power. Um, but the one thing that just came out, gosh, I want to say it was this morning. My days are all blurred together. It's been a long week already. <laughs> um, the CFPB, which is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which was created by the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010, I believe is when they passed it. After we had all that... Mortgage um, meltdown. Question, I was going to say, that, yeah. was, that's a good way of putting it, yes. <laughs> no, it's a mortgage meltdown. I mean, it was. Um, it's a 15,000-page law that rewrote all of the financial institutions, not just mortgage. It rewrote credit cards, auto loans, payday loans, so on and so forth. Um, and this is the agency that now governs any type of business that money changes hands. If money changes hands in this business in the sense of lending, savings... Uh, checking, short-term loans, credit cards, whatever, they handle it. Um, they issued a warning to all websites that compare mortgage companies. And the warning is the first step. The warning from a CFPB is, hey guys, we are watching you. We don't like what you're doing. This is why we don't like it. You need to stop. Um, if they don't heed the warning, then they start getting penalized, shut down, so on and so forth. But the basis behind the warning is when you go to a place like Nerd Wallet or Lending Tree or any of those places, you put your information in and they give you five lenders. And they show the rates and they show the fees and they show the costs. Well, it's implied that those are the five best lenders. Mm -hmm. There's 50,000 mortgage companies in Arizona before you start taking on the nation. And so that is what the CFPB is taking issue with, is is implying that we found you the five best. Well, it's not the five best, and they can't make that implication. And There's so much individuality to the way that you treat an application based on the house, based on the, the client, based on their financial goals. And so it would be very difficult for um, an algorithm, I guess, to match you to a lender that meets your needs. Absolutely. And that's, and that's what they're taking issue with. Um, and so, although it's convenient and easy, your best bet is to use somebody in your marketplace that you can see, that you can meet, that you can touch, you can call a local number and talk to, as opposed to a big box website that is going to compare rates for you. And you've heard me say a lot of times, in my opinion, the rate is the least important part of the transaction. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It really is. We want to see um, that buyer be able to successfully close on the sale. And we want to know, I know for us as real estate agents, whether we're representing a buyer or if we're representing a seller, we want to know that somebody can't just ghost us. And so if I have a local lender that I need to talk to, if I can't get a phone call back, I could always visit their office and have a conversation face to face. And so whether you're presenting an offer or um, you know, you're competing for a house, it's really important to the agents as well that we know that, that our client is in good hands. And, and I agree with you and it, there are I've come across a lot of loan officers in my career that something starts going sideways and they don't answer the phone. They disappear. They don't want to they don't want to issue bad news. I mean, Ray and I didn't have the best conversation yesterday, but we had it and <laughs> yeah. we're moving on and we're going to we're going to fix this transaction and it's fixable, but I made a mistake. I think everybody in the transaction made a mistake, but right. I owned up to it. I've got my end that I'm working on. But a lot of lenders and loan officers aren't willing to do that. I had a friend, I was talking about this with a friend of mine the other day and he he said how do we know the experience level of an LO? And I said, well, we all have NMLS numbers. 
and NMLS numbers were started to get issued in 2010. Well, my NMLS number is 304969. Today's NMLS numbers are eight digits long. So if you're dealing with a loan officer who has an NMLS number that's eight digits long and it starts with a two, they probably got their license a month or two ago. I've been doing this for 30 years. I have one of the very first NMLS numbers that were out there, and there's a lot of great LOs in Tucson that have very low uh, right. NMLS numbers that have been doing this for a very long time. So a real quick way is look at the business card. They, they've got a, you know, an NMLS number that's in the 300,000s and not the 12 millions. You're probably dealing with somebody who's been around a while. Right. Do, do you think there's one, <clears throat> Scott, do you think there's one or two questions that you would give the buyer something in a pocket say, hey, ask these two questions. It may help you understand what the lender knows and doesn't know. I know you, it's like 20 questions, but there's two you can think of at the top this, of your head. This might me being a little bit of a jerk, but ask the person that's doing a loan if they've ever owned a home or done a loan themselves. I mean... That's a good place to start. <laughs> you know, um, the other one really for me, the other part of it is personality. I don't get along with every person that calls me to, right. to buy a home because I've, I've got a strong personality, but I have other L's in my office that I can refer them to. But I think part of it is you've got to feel comfortable speaking with that individual mm -hmm. and you've got to feel comfortable with the conversations they're having with you because if you don't have that comfort level back and forth there, it's going to be a really long, bumpy road for that transaction. Right, right. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things for people to share is their financial their their financial picture and so typically it's a complete stranger and maybe worse it's somebody you know really well and you don't know if you want to open up you know all of your business to them so that's i think that level of comfort is really important uh, absolutely and in, in in feeling that your information is going to be kept confidential and in as it should be and needs it to should be. be yeah no we as agents you know people think we know everything that's going on in their finances and we rarely do we just know whether or not they're qualified and we, and we try to emphasize to them that the personal information you're giving you're giving to only to your the lender we don't need the information only you know that you're qualified yeah so thanks for um being here this is the i am real estate show on 10 30 a.m kvoi the voice we will be back in and finish our conversation with john after the break we're back john Ray and Sandra here to talk a little bit about lending. First thing I wanted to ask, and we haven't asked this question in a long time, John, is when I come to you for a lending information or lending info, what do I need to bring with me so to, to you can help me out as a, a lender? So as a buyer? As Some a buyer. Bar? Um, it would be a photo ID, your income. Typically, I don't ask for tax returns. Um, they're usually not necessary unless you're self-employed. Uh, last two years W-2s and two months worth of bank statements. And that's going to be enough for us to have a really good idea of what we can do for you. And there's two things. Um, I'm trying to get the words right. One is a pre-qual and one is a... Pre-approval. Pre-approval. Can you tell me the difference? So a pre-qual is going to be me having a conversation with you right now and you're like, hey, I make $10,000 a month. I have $20,000 to put down. I checked my credit report online. I have a 720 credit score. And I want to buy a three hundred thousand dollar house. Okay. Well, Ray, the numbers look like they'll work. Okay. That that's pretty much. It's a little bit more than that, but it's pretty much in a nutshell what a prequal is. Okay. A pre-approval is taking the full application, pulling credit, getting all the income documentation, running automated underwriting. If we don't get an underwriting under automated underwriting approval, getting that loan in front of an underwriter and them clearing the income conditions and the asset conditions and the credit so that when you go and shop, now all I need is an appraisal, a contract, and a prelim. So there's you, there's the underwriter, and then there's the bank. Yes. That's that the process? Yep. Okay. And so a pre-approval, pre you've seen it, we issue a pre-approval letter. It says you're yeah. pre-approved to buy this house for this amount of money at this interest rate, and we just need a contract. Okay. It, I think in the real estate world that holds a lot more weight than just an Arizona PQF. Sure. Absolutely. We like to see those when we have listings. Well, one of the things that um, we kind of use as a temperature check for the market is when we hear from other people in our industry, what's going on. So what is going on in the lending world? Um, last week, 
nationally, there was a 7.4% increase in purchase applications. Um, that's a big increase. Usually, we have a percent or two here. This mm-hmm. was a large increase. I believe part of that increase is nationally interest rates dipped below 6% for a few days. Again, I'm pretty much myself below 6% right now with almost any borrower. We can get there. But I think when that hit the news, it spurred a lot of interest, I guess pun intended on that one, (laughs) um, (laughs) for people to go and uh, put in applications to buy a home. And so we've seen an increase. And we're going to start heading into the warmer months, and I think we're just going to continue to see that. Um, I think it's still going to be a good buying season. I, I agree. And we always talk about the fact that once we start hitting the holidays, we do see things slow down. And January typically is an uptick in business for us anyway. Um, but definitely February, March are a great time of year for good inventory and to see things actually moving out there. And I obviously I'm not a real estate agent, you guys are, but I, I've done this for a very long time and I've always seen by April and May, I don't think we're going to be back into bidding wars, but you definitely have competition out there to get a home. And for me, from a lender's perspective, if you're in a position that you think you want to buy a home this year and you have your down payment and you have good credit, let's get you qualified now. Um, Because you may be able to grab a better deal in March and April than possibly May and June. I don't know what your guys' opinion is on that, but I, I feel like beating the summer buying season, you know, here in March might be a great idea. We actually have such great seasons for, for real estate because our weather is so fabulous. Um, And so other than the holidays, probably the hottest part of the year is when we're going to see only serious buyers out. People aren't, if they're on the (laughs) fence, they're staying indoors until it cools down a little bit. Right. So, so we do have a, fairly good season when it comes to selling homes. Um, This time of year, typically what we see, because we did just have the gem show, we've got rodeo coming up. We have a lot of out of town visitors. And a lot of times I think people come here and they start as snowbirds. They want to spend a couple months here and then live the rest of the year, wherever they're from. And over a time, the time period of a couple of years, that flops to where they want to spend most of their time here and they'll leave for two months instead. So that's kind of a a mindset change, I think, for a lot of people. So this time of year, we see people that are here, they're on vacation, they they want like a short-term rental Mm -hmm. and there's nothing available because um, it's just, it's a great time of year to be in Tucson. And so they'll start looking for homes and start thinking we need to, we need to do this in advance and not wait until the last minute because there just isn't that much availability. I, I will tell you over the years, the only time I've ever ever do financing for vacation homes is February, March, and October, November. It's okay. rare for me to get a request for a second home or a vacation home application other than those four months. It's it's, it's really interesting. And I don't know. If, it, 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 I hope that's I think that's kind of unique to Southern Arizona because of our climate. Mm-hmm. I, I I think it is and a lot to do with our climate. So if someone's looking for that vacation home or second home, how are how how's the uh, lending side of that right now? So the interest rates are slightly higher. Um, the main reason is these new loan level pricing adjustments we were talking about mm-hmm. that came out. Uh, and they're trying to keep that money for first-time home buyers mm-hmm. available as opposed for second home. Um, it does require a little bit more down. Uh, I would recommend 20%, but you can get into a second home with just as little as 10% down. Um, if you do less than 20% down, mortgage insurance is higher on a second home. Uh, but the qualifying requirements are definitely, the underwriting requirements are more stringent. Uh, you know, somebody with a 620 credit score and credit issues is going to have a real hard time qualifying for a second mm-hmm. home. You're going to want to be in that 720, 740 well-qualified borrower. They're going to want to see that you have ample reserves in the bank because now you've got two mortgage payments. And if something happens, they want to know that you can make both those payments out of savings. Got a question for you. Can um, a second home be on a USDA loan or a VA loan? No. Second home is going to be a conventional product. Only. That's what I need to know. Okay, that's good to know. People realize, hey, what? Well, 
I, I got a VA. You know, I, I bought that conventional. Now I got a VA. I don't want to get a second home. Maybe I can do it. So you, I can do it, but you just cannot. Yeah, Raymond and I just um, put a listing on the market out in Academy Village, which is a 55 and older community. Yep. And it's a townhome. And one of the residents came by and she looked at it and said, this would be a great guest house so people aren't staying with me at my house. And I thought, that is a great idea. What a great idea. So uh, we'll see if she comes back and puts that thought in writing. But uh, Remind everybody how to get a hold of you, John. Uh, they can call me on my cell phone, 520-247-3610, or catch me at john, J-O-N, at inspiredlifemortgage.com. We want to thank uh, John Spur, the owner of Inspired Life Mortgages, for coming on out to the show today. We'll talk to you on the other side. All right, we're back to the show. We'll get right into the show. But we are honored to have with us Jessica Cox, who is a 2023 Grand Marshal for the Rodeo Parade. How you doing today, Jessica? Doing good. Um, we're so proud and so honored to have you on the show. So thank you so much for coming. We want to say that thank you. But I don't want to waste my time on this, on this minute we have with you. So please tell us a little bit about yourself. I am a the Grand Marshal, and it's exciting. I'm just trying to let that soak in because it's been <laughs> such an uh, such a privilege, especially yes. knowing all the legends who former Grand Marshals and to yes. be a part of that community. I've been in Tucson for over 25 years, wow. and uh, came here after I was in Sierra Vista, Arizona, where I was born. And okay. then once I came out here as a teenager, been here ever since. Graduated the University of Arizona. Did everything in my life without the use of two things. What is that? <laughs> I was born without both my arms. Okay, okay. So okay. that's how I do. I do everything with my feet. Uh huh. And and you don't have a short list of accomplishments <laughs> either. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about some of the things that you're most proud of. I feel like I've been just so fortunate and blessed. I have so many things in my life. Um, one of the things that people uh, have heard is that I became a black belt, first armless black belt in the American Taekwondo Association. Oh my God, congratulations. Go ahead, keep going. I'm and just going to write this down. And I continued on. Um, now I'm a fourth degree, so I uh, practice out there in Marana at Best Martial Arts. My husband and I practice there, and it's been such a great community there. I'm also the world's first armless pilot. So wow. I fly planes with my feet. What, what um, type of plane do you fly? Do you I fly a 1946 415C air coop airplane. Whoa. That, sorry, is that one engine or two engines? That's a single engine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> a vintage <laughs> plane. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I was trying to sound smart. I'm like, I'm not, this question not going to sound smart. Let me just ask it and get it out the way. <laughs> we actually have a few uh, pilots in our circle. And um, one of our pilot clients just sent us pictures of his two-year-old. And I'm thinking this child is going to be exposed to so much because, you know, he's got his photos in the plane there. But, yeah, when you're, I think that when you have these opportunities, um, and I know you want to share those opportunities as well, that's an awesome thing. Giving back is most important because I've been so blessed. And to do that by helping the community of people with disabilities and the focus on those children who are born without limbs. Yeah, I think your story is wonderful, but I'm sure there are the schools, other colleges, other nonprofits, and probably some businesses that would really like to learn a little bit more about this from you. And so you're available for speaking opportunities, are we correct? I speak uh, all year long. So far, 27 countries around the world. Whoa. Sometimes my speech is translated right there on stage. So I am open to invitations to speak anywhere, everywhere, corporations, um, nonprofits, a lot of events, annual uh -huh. events and conferences. That's what I fill my schedule with all year round. So um, to start off, how they get a hold of you, Jessica? If you go to jessicacox.com, you can find out more and uh, hear about my, look into my story and, 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 and if reach out to me as well. If you'd like to um, connect on a speaking uh, invitation, I would love to speak with you. Yeah, and I hear that, that you're going to be the Grand Marshal now and that also there's going to be some special people on your float. Yes, so I have a wonderful nonprofit called Right Footed Foundation, and it helps children with disabilities, with so the mm -hmm. focus on children born without limbs. And this year at the Rodeo Parade, as the Grand Marshal, the Rodeo Committee, Rodeo Parade Com Committee is giving me um, a float, and I'm going to have nine children with disabilities. Eight of the children will be limb different, meaning they were born without a hand or a leg or uh -huh. some limb difference. And they will be joining me on this wonderful float, nine children with disabilities, uh, to inspire uh, the world about th that fact that disability doesn't mean inability. Yes. Have you met the children that will be on the float? 
I have met some of them. <laughs> are they, they so excited? They are so <laughs> excited. Oh my goodness, they're. I just hope that they can uh, stay on that boat. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure that you are an inspiration to them, but I have to guess that they inspire you as well. They do. As a young person, I never really had someone like a role model who was also born without both arms until later in my teens. And that that relationship of a mentor Uh changed my life Uh because someone could understand you. Someone can um, just, you know, tell you to suck it up sometimes. (laughs) And that's what I I think is important for, for, for this, uh, for these kids as well, because that's what we are all about empowering them to have that support that may not come, you know, and they may not have that in their same communities. You never know. So to be that role model and that encouragement to them and their parents is, it's such a pleasure. Is there a time in your in your learning or some time when you kind of identified that moment where you realized that this was something that isn't going to hold you back? I think my parents set this that stage very early on, mm-hmm. and I just you know I, I've I've been challenged since birth with you can't do it, you don't have arms, or you know you, you, there's no way. But for me, it's always just transforming that to, yes, you can. You can find a way. Uh-huh. You can't give up. You just persevere through it, and you get through it, and and you persist, and you never say those words, I can't, mm-hmm. because that sets you up for failure. Absolutely. Um, being the Grand Marshal of the Rodeo Parade, has that opened doors for you? It has been so tremendous. I uh, have had very little sleep in the last <laughs> <laughs> And the community is wonderful because they are the reason I am where I am, the support and that encouragement all throughout my childhood. And now being able to make the community aware of what we're trying to do for so many children with disabilities and this amazing project that I haven't even said yet. But that's what's so great about is just bringing that elevated awareness to the community and having the Grand Marshal title is allowing that. That's awesome. Well, so that's, I, that's a great a great, it's a great segue thing to go right into. Yes, Let's tell us. What, tell us about it. Tell you about the impossible airplane. Yes. Yes. And if you break down impossible, it's actually I'm possible. Uh, it will be the first airplane in aviation history that can be flown with feet. And we are building that right now as we speak. It will be modified right here in Tucson. This piece of history this RV-10 airplane, a four-seater, single-engine airplane that will be flown all over the world uh, and would have been designed, modified here in Tucson. So that connection to right here in our own home of Tucson, Arizona, an airplane, first ever airplane in history, is what we're doing right now. And we are trying to get the support of the community, community partners on on board, because it is a very expensive endeavor, Mm -hmm. but ultimately the message is the most important thing to continue to inspire these kids around the world. What is the price tag on on doing this? On an airplane? Well, um, just to give you an idea, kit airplanes have gone up in price Mm -hmm. since the, um, during the pandemic, a lot of people started to build these airplanes because they were a lot home more often. Um, (coughs) And it's about 80,000 to start with a kit airplane right now. About the, the kit that we're that we're working okay. with, so that gives you an idea. But that doesn't include labor. That doesn't include include all this other stuff that goes. Yeah, and the modifications with, you're doing to it too. Just the modifications is a whole new project being done by various people. Some engineers from the University of Arizona Engineering Department wow. great, are great. taking on. Um, I should say future engineers because they're students. <laughs> they're taking on this wonderful project to create some of the modifications. So that's right here at the university. And um, the simulator of the airplane is being restored at the Pima Community College Aviation Technology. Wow. That's awesome. I actually expected to hear a much larger number. So the fact that you can accomplish this for less than a million dollars <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> is amazing. I mean, what an opportunity. And then how, once the, what is your timeline for the plane? The airplane... Well, first of all, we're calling it Project 2025. Okay. Because we have to finish the build, and we fortunately have wonderful volunteers behind us that are making it possible. Once we build that plane, uh, 2024, next year, we would spend experimenting on the safety 
-hmm. measures, uh, experimenting on the modifications, making sure this airplane test flying it essentially, uh, making sure it's safe in the skies. And then we should be finished by 2025. The big goal uh -huh. is to not only fly the plane around the world, but to fly it over the opening ceremonies of the Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2028. Good job. Ah, uh, that gave me chills. Yes. <laughs> Honestly, it gave Ooh. me chills. That it would be amazing. I just, I love your goals, and it just, even if they, to me, they seem so out there. But you, you see in your, your eyes, they look achievable. You're like these things are going to happen. I can make these things occur. You just need the sponsors to help you. So they give you the funding to help make these things come. Even if they don't, you're going to make this happen. Uh, we are determined. <laughs> it says on the side of the airplane, believe you can fly. <laughs> so that's what it is about, that belief. And it starts with that belief and that, that setting that goal and saying, I'm going to make it happen and we're going to make it happen. I need people to help me. Yes. But you can't give up. And this is a 501c3? It's a 501c3. And right how long? Here from here in Tucson, in Ar Ar Tucson Arizona. <laughs> when did you establish the nonprofit? So the nonprofit's been around for six years and it has been, um, it's been, Recently, uh, people are starting to recognize this nonprofit here in Tucson. It's been, you know it's still fairly young for mm -hmm. a nonprofit, but we're uh, doing amazing I things. I want to make sure I get you right. The nonprofit is called Project Twenty Twenty Five, right? No, the nonprofit is Right Footed Foundation International. Thank you. And people can donate to this foundation by going to donate.fearlessjessica.com, and we need all the support we can get. We're looking for community partners. Okay, so the, um, obviously monetary support are there other businesses that may be able to do in kind is there anything that you're looking for as far as a workforce to help make this happen yes businesses we are going to wrap this airplane and it's going to represent tucson all over the world mm -hmm. and you know if all goes well over the olympic games so we're going to have uh, all sorts of the representation on the plane itself oh wow okay so do a, a big wrap with all these companies and, and their logos and such to get that uh, exposure out there that it is a homegrown project right here in Tucson and we hope to make Tucson proud with this pro project that we'll be seeing. We're here with Jessica Cox. We want to let you know if you want to sit back and have her speak for you, speak at one of your events. It's uh, jessicacox.com and she'll be able to tell her story and, and brief you a little bit about her and her project and what she's going on. And we, and we just want to take a minute to thank our sponsors, Horizon Inspections, Indie Realty, Inspired Life Mortgage, and Rego Pest Prevention. And we have a new sponsor, Pioneer Title um, Agency, as well. Can you give us your, your contact information one more time, Jessica? Sure. Jessica Cox at donate.fearlessjessica.com or jessicacox.com. Awesome. Right Footed Foundation, everybody. <laughs>